this is Dr. James Strickler. This is a course in United States history. This lecture concerns Chapter 25, The Cold War, in the United States history textbook, American Yop. First thing I need to do in discussing this chapter is to make sure that you understand what is meant by the Cold War. The Cold War refers to a time period um, in the late 20th century in which the United, I should say from the mid to the late 20th century, in which the United States and the Soviet Union were at war trying to obtain dominance over the globe without actually firing shots at each other. That's why it's referring at, referred to as a Cold War. There were people that saw that this would be coming after the Second World War. One of them was George Kennan, who was the charged affair of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union. He looked around at the state of things in the Soviet Union at the end of the Second World War and realized that the United States and the Soviet Union were not going to remain as allies. They had come together to fight the threat of Nazi Germany, but it was a marriage of convenience. They had diametrically opposed philosophies of government and how the world should be run. So he sent a long telegram to his um, supervisors in the State Department in the United States. Now, when I say a long telegram, you got to understand how unusual this was. Telegrams were mechanisms for transferring information from one side of the globe to the other in print. They were essentially sent through Morse code sort of signals, tapping out each letter. So telegrams were oftentimes very short messages. This is before the advent of global phone calls. It was before, well, I should say global phone calls could have existed, but they were not a convenient thing. Certainly we didn't have the internet, email, cell phones, things like that. So it was hard oftentimes to get communications from one side of the world to the other. So telegrams were one way to do it, but they were kind of a laborious process to send. So they were usually used for short messages. Well, George Kennan felt that what he wanted to say was so important that it needed to go through immediately as a telegram could, rather than waiting for a regular uh, typed up mailed letter to get there perhaps days or even weeks later. But he had a lot to say. So his telegram was very long. And in it, he warned his country about the threat of Soviet communism. He described world communism as like a malignant parasite, which feeds only on diseased tissue. He said that the, the steady advance of an uneasy Russian nationalism in the guise of international Marxism is a more dangerous and insidious threat than ever before. He also said that there could be no cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union, and instead that the United States should um, engage in a policy of containment to try to stop this malignant thing called communism from spreading elsewhere in the world. His was a warning bell to the United States that the cooperation of the Second World War would not continue, that the Soviet Union, far from being an ally, would become our sworn enemy. His views were seconded by Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had been the Prime Minister of Great Britain during the Second World War. But after the Second World War ended, the um, electorate in Great Britain decided that they did needed a different kind of leader, and he was voted out of office. He then, in 1946, went to visit his friend Harry Truman in Missouri. Missouri is where Harry Truman, the President of the United States, was from. While there, Winston Churchill gave a speech at a local college. And in that speech, he described an iron curtain that was descending across the European continent. He was referring to the idea of Europe being essentially divided between the communist-dominated East and the capitalist-dominated West. He described it as an iron curtain because he saw the people on the other side of this division essentially becoming prisoners to communism, where they would not have the same sort of rights and privileges that people were expected to have in civilized countries around the world. 
Winston Churchill's um, descriptive language of an iron curtain then became sta a standard way to describe the division of Europe during the time of the Cold War. On one side of that curtain, the Soviet Union dominated. On the other side of it, the United States dominated. And this was essentially a conflict between Soviet dictatorship, which tried to impose communism on the people that it ruled over, and United States style democracy that tried to ensure that people had um, freedom to buy and sell what they want, which we refer to as capitalism. This is what the Cold War was about. Would democracy and capitalism be the way that countries around the world built their systems? Or would it build, they build them on the dictatorship and communism of the Soviet Union? Now, I need to take a moment to make sure you understand the difference between these different points of view. Democracy is a loose term. It's not correctly used most of the time, if we go back to its original meaning in ancient Greece. But what it generally means in a rough sense is that the people control their government, usually through elections. A dictatorship is where the government controls the people. Now, why might somebody want that? Because they believe that the government knows better than the people, that the country is full of a bunch of ignorant rubes that should be ruled by elites. This is not just a view that, that uh, communists had. It's a view that oftentimes creeps into government as you have a few elites in the country who think they know better than the democratic masses and try to find ways to impose their will upon them. In a Soviet style communist regime, this is just made sort of explicit in the way things are set up, that there are rulers above who know better who dictate to those below. Now, why did they do this? What are they trying to do better? They are trying to create a more fair system, which is what communism is about. Communism is about that Everybody um, works according to their ability and everyone receives according to their needs, which means that you're not going to have rich or poor. Instead, everybody will be in a um, middle ground somewhere. Now, in reality, communism has always failed when put in practice. And rather than people ending up in some middle ground of prosperity, the entire country degenerates to a low common denominator where people are poor generally. Now, in opposition to this is capitalism. Capitalism has potential for everyone to become much better off than they otherwise would. In fact, the average person will be better off under capitalism. The problem is, is that there's going to be great disparity in capitalism. Some people will get amazingly rich. Some people will suffer in great poverty. And there's the appeal of communism. If you're the people that are suffering in poverty, or even just you're relatively poor compared to looking to the rich people, you might think the system is unfair. You might be willing to embrace a system where someone above imposes order that you think makes everything more fair for everyone. So communism, while um, there have been times when it's been sort of a dirty word in American history, still has appeal for people, even in th this day. Communism then, therefore, was something that appealed during this time period also to people after the Second World War, people whose society has been crushed by the, the difficulties of war and were now living in poverty, might be willing to look to some government that promised that they would lift them out of them, out of their situation and make things more fair for them. We can actually divide up the Cold War into three basic periods. The first period from the 1940s when the Second World War ended through the 1960s, we will call the first Cold War. This was a series of crises and escalations between the two sides. The United States and the Soviet Union found themselves in conflict over and over again, and those conflicts scarily potentially leading to a hot war, although it fortunately never happened. We will talk more about specific events that happened during this first Cold War as we continue through this chapter. This there was an intermediate period then in the Cold War following the first Cold War, which we refer to with the French term détente. Détente refers to an easing of hostilities between two adversaries. It's a French word. This characterized the period from the mid 1960s through 1979, as both sides tried to ease tensions through dialogue, negotiations, summits, treaties, agreements, etc. They were still active adversaries, 
but they were trying to at least not kill each other. The period of detente came to an end with the rise of Ronald Reagan to power in the United States. He was elected president in 1980, but his influence really began to change the nature of the relationship in 1979. This was also changed because of the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan, which led the president, who was still in office in 1979, Jimmy Carter, to become more hostile toward the Soviet Union. But the Second Cold War is really the Reagan era of government, in which he decided that the way to defeat communism was to actively oppose it. He believed that the communist system in the Soviet Union could not sustain the kind of effort to keep up with the capitalist system of the United States. That if the United States could be threatening enough to the Soviet Union, they would have to do things beyond their means and that their system would eventually collapse. He turned out to be right. And as a consequence, he led the United States to victory in the Cold War. Now let's begin to discuss this economic, this period of the Cold War in greater detail by discussing the economic, political, and military conflicts that were during its early years. As I already talked about, at the end of the Second World War, Europe was essentially divided in half. In the West, we had capitalist democracies friendly to the United States. In the East, we had communist dictatorships friendly to the Soviet Union. This was because the Soviet Union, by the end of the war, had occupied these countries, and it then imposed communist regimes on them after the war was over. The United States may have disliked that this was happening, but they couldn't do anything about it unless they were willing to go to war with the Soviet Union at this time. Having just fought a giant war on two fronts against Japan and Nazi Germany, the appetite of the United States for an open war with the Soviet Union was not very much. So we allowed the Iron Curtain to fall, Eastern Europe to be put under communist rule, and to be within what we call the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, while the United States had its sphere of influence over Western Europe. Early on in the Second World War, it was already obvious that the democracies of Western Europe would have more in common with, the, with each other than with their ally, the Soviet Union. Early on in the war, Winston Churchill, the leader of Great Britain, and Franklin Roosevelt, the President of the United States, met together to reach an agreement that became known as the Atlantic Charter. The Charter called for the creation of the United Nations to instill a set of values, hopefully on the rest of the world, that would mirror those of Western Europe and the United States, of capitalist democracy. This was the beginning of, uh, of a series of events that would eventually lead to the founding of the United Nations, but it would not lead to an end of the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. After Franklin Roosevelt died as president of the United States, Harry Truman took over as president, and this caused a significant change in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Franklin Roosevelt had been an optimist during the war. He knew that it was a marriage of convenience between the Soviet Union and the United States, but he also believed that through that engagement between the United States and the Soviet Union, that eventually the Soviet Union could be influenced to accept the kind of societal norms that he and um, uh, Winston Churchill had agreed to in the Atlantic Charter. Well, when he died, Harry Truman took over with a much more negative view of the Soviet Union. He saw them as our enemies, as the charged affairs of the Moscow embassy had, had said previously in one of the early slides in this chapter. He therefore, Harry Truman as president, took a hard line against the Soviet Union. He believed that it was our job to stand up against them. This conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union became immediately apparent when the United Nations was founded and they both became permanent members of the UN Security Council. Remember from a previous chapter that the United Nations essentially has two different organizations. One is the General Assembly, 
where all countries can be a part. The other is a Security Council with five permanent members and ten rotating members. On that Security Council, the five permanent members have veto power over the, the powers of the United Nations being used to try to force somebody else in the world to behave in a certain way. Well, with the Soviet Union and the United States both on the Security Council, and them both having completely opposite views of how the world should be run, this put the United Nations Security Council in a sort of gridlock, where things couldn't be done because they simply opposed each other there. But this didn't stop the fruit of the Atlantic um, Charter from going forward during the creation of the United Nations. In 1944, a conference was held at a hotel in the United States called Bretton Woods in Vermont. There, it was, this conference was actually officially called the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. The idea of this conference, which is commonly just known as Bretton Woods, was try to make a, a um, sustainable global financial system that would be a, that countries could all work through in the post-World War II period. It was an idea to reorganize the world economy in a more sustainable way. Remember that before World War II, we'd had the Great Depression. So we had two giant crises that had faced the world in short order. And there was a belief that financial economic situations had led in some ways to these problems, not just the Great Depression, but World War II. And so having a more sustainable financial system for everybody in the world was hoped, it was hoped would be a way to secure a more, a more lasting peace for the world too. From the Bretton Woods Conference, we then ended up with another series of conferences that came later that established the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. These were two direct products of Bretton Woods. Now, what these did was try to, as I said, bring stability to international finance. They did this by fixing the United States and gold as the reserve currency of the world. In other words, if you were a country and you wanted to collect wealth in some way that you could hold on to and use later, you would collect it as gold or dollar bills. Now, why dollar bills? because they had the backing of the United States of America behind them. The United States of America was considered the most stable country in the world. Its currency was most likely to hold value. So these two organizations were set up to accomplish this. The IMF set at fixed exchange rates between currencies around the world based on the dollar and gold. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development Meanwhile, provided financial assistance for countries that have been ravaged by the war that would allow them to engage in reconstruction efforts. In other words, give loans to countries. But it would give them based on this currency system that had been created by the International Monetary Fund. Another set of agreements that came from the conference at Bretton Woods were the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the creation of the World Trade Organization as a follow-up to it. The Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade is just what it sounds like. It was an international agreement in which countries could agree to try to have open and free trade with each other. Eventually, this led to the World Trade Organization as a mechanism to try to enforce this among countries. 123 countries agreed to be part of this international trade system. But please notice that these two agreements, first the, um, the setup of the IMF fund and uh, secondly of global agreement on tariffs and trade, essentially are trying to create international systems based on the capitalist United Nations model, including using the um, currency of the United States as the reserve currency for the world. Of course, the Soviet Union would not be happy about these developments. Harry Truman, as President of the United States, in 1947, announced what became known as the Truman Doctrine, a doctrine designed to contain communism to where it was already established and not let it spread to other places. 
the first act under the Truman Doctrine was to send aid of $400 million to Greece and Turkey, essentially to try to bribe them to not become communist, to give them money so that the more um, capitalist friendly Western turned governments of those countries could fight against the developing communist uprising within their own borders. This was an idea that um, that became sort of standard policy for the United States in the Cold War. Take countries that might be drifting toward communism and try to provide them with a financial incentive to stay aligned with the United States. This was Harry Truman's view of how to stop communism from spreading at this time. Well, this idea in general led to what became known as the Marshall Plan. This was a plan proposed by a United States general, George Marshall, who thought that the way to prevent the countries of Europe from becoming part of the communist sphere of influence was to offer them aid to recover and rebuild from the devastation of World War II. Solid, Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, saw this as a Trojan horse, a way to get these countries to buy into the capitalist Western United States side of things. Well, the Marshall Plan was a great success. The United States invested $13 billion toward reconstructing countries across particularly Western Europe. And this did lead to them supporting, generally speaking, the United States system for the world. But the Soviet Union was not going to let the countries under its sphere of influence fall under the spell of the Marshall Plan. So they offered money to those countries too. This became known as the Molotov Plan, after the minister of the Soviet Union, Molotov, who we met previously in this course, when he reached his agreement with the minister Ribbentrop of, the, of Nazi Germany to divide Poland, the non-aggression pact we talked about then. Well, he was still a powerful official in the Soviet Union. And what he did was he got the Soviet Union to make pledges of financial assistance to the countries of Eastern Europe that were under the Soviet sphere of influence. Now, these were oftentimes hollow pledges. The money never really came through. But they coerced the countries to agreeing to those systems as an alternative to them trying to take money from the Marshall Plan. What ended up happening was when these countries came to get their money, there were lots of strings attached, which essentially brought them under the rule of the Soviet government. This led to the countries of Eastern Europe, even those who remained independent of the Soviet Union, essentially becoming what we can call satellite countries of the Soviet Union. So what we see on this map is that the countries of Eastern Europe fall into two colors. There's a pink color and a darker red color. The darker red color are ones that ended up actually being absorbed into the Soviet Union. They became part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, no longer independent countries. The ones in the lighter colored, the pink, remain technically independent countries, but they were directly under the influence of the Soviet Union. They were not truly independent. Taken all together, these countries behind the Iron Curtain were collectively known as Eastern Bloc countries, referring to the fact that they were to the Eastern Europe and they were a bloc together in their policies and their government structures. Now, you've previously learned in this course that after World War II, Germany was divided up into four pieces. Those four pieces would be temporarily ruled over by the Soviet Union, the United States, France, and Great Britain. You also learned that the capital city of Berlin was also divided into four pieces among those four powers. But the city of Berlin sat in the middle of the Soviet zone over the, that, their one quarter chunk of the country. This allowed in 1948 for the Soviet Union to create a blockade of Berlin they would not allow any goods to go into the city to sustain it. Now, the way that goods were taken from the Western held parts of Germany to the Western held parts in Berlin 
was through a single road, which the Soviets had guaranteed safe passage on for representatives of the United States, Great Britain, and France. Well, they shut off that one route. Their goal was to essentially starve out the Westerners so they could take control of Berlin in its entirety. In response to this, the United States and the other Western powers organized the Berlin Airlift, where for over 11 months they flew into the Western zones of Berlin everything that the population needed because they were being blockaded by the surrounding Soviet troops. Nothing could get in or out otherwise. The fact that the Western powers, particularly the United States, were able to sustain the Berlin airlift for 11 months eventually led to the Soviets lifting the blockade in 1949 and allow goods to move once more on that single road from the Western parts of Germany to the Western parts of Berlin. But that one road became heavily guarded so that neither East people from the Soviet controlled part of Germany could get on it nor those coming from the West could get off of it. They could only travel from the West to West Berlin back and forth. Eventually in 1961, the Soviet Union would decide that a wall should be erected around the Western portions of Berlin so that the influence of those Westerners in that area could not leak out into the eastern part of Germany that was supported by the Soviet Union and controlled by it. They were worried that if there was too much contact between West Berliners and East Germans, that the East Germans would not be happy with their communist ruled system. Well, eventually in 1949, the Western powers realized that there was never going to be a reunification of Germany. Parts of it had already been cut off and given to Poland. The Eastern, which was part of the Soviet bloc. The Eastern quarter of Germany that was under Soviet control was not going to be reunited with the West as long as the, the Soviets remained in control. They were going to make sure that it remained a communist country. So in 1949, the Western powers dealt with this reality by simply dividing Germany into two countries. The West became the Federal Republic of Germany, a democratic capitalist country. The Eastern portion of Germany became the German Democratic Republic, a communist dictatorship modeled after the Soviet Union and directly influenced by it. The United States, seeing the growing threat of the Soviet Union and worrying about its influence on Western Europe, entered into a treaty in 1949 with several countries in Europe, particularly those in the West. This was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, otherwise called NATO. NATO was a defensive pact. The heart of NATO's alliance was that a a war on any one of the countries that were a member of NATO would be considered a war upon all of them. So if the Soviet Union ever tried to invade West Germany to reunite Germany as a communist country, France, England, Spain, the United States, Canada, Norway, Italy, Greece, Turkey, etc. would consider this an invasion of all of them and they would all go to war with the Soviet Union. This was done to be a deterrent to stop the Soviet Union from trying to spread by force to the West. In response to this, the Soviet Union then formed the Warsaw Pact, a similar agreement among the, the satellite countries and the Soviet Union, in which they agreed that any aggression from the Western countries would be met by a common response from them. The United States tried to invade East Germany to take, may, reunite it with West Germany. That would be considered making war upon Poland, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, etc., all at the same time. And the United States would have to fight them all. So on both sides, this was a deterrent to the other side. At the same time that these difficulties were going on in Europe, the Chinese Civil War which had sprung up in the aftermath of World War II, 
was coming to an end. When I talked to you about the origins of the Second World War in a previous chapter, I described how Japan invaded Manchuria and then continued to press forward across China, defeating the Chinese army in city after city. That army that they were defeating was the Nationalist Army, led by a man named Ken, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Sorry, I had to get that name out properly. Well, his inability to protect China against the Japanese led to the um, rise of a rival faction led by a man named Mao Zedong. Chairman Mao, as he eventually became called, was a committed communist, and he organized people as communists to defend China and eventually defeat the nationalists. His Chinese Communist Party declared rule over China in 1949. They eventually banished the, the nationalists from their country who escaped to the island of Taiwan, which remains in effect an independent country from the rest of China today. The nationalists who settled in Taiwan claim to be the legitimate rulers of all China. China claims to be the legitimate rulers of Taiwan. The United States acknowledges the existence of both without taking a position on their dispute to this day. Well, when Mao Zedong declared that his Chinese communists had come to victory in the communist Chinese, excuse me, in the Chinese uh, Civil War, he then declared the creation of the People's Republic of China. The most populous country in the world had become a communist country. This really knocked the United States back on its heels during the Cold War. Not only did they have the menace of the Soviet Union facing them as a, as a communist country, but now the country in the world with the most people was a communist country too. This led to a great fear of communism spreading to more and more places. In response to these sorts of threats, there is a national security memorandum written by the United States um, national security apparatus in 1950. It's known just by the, the, num, the, the um, title NSC-68, NSC standing for National Security um, uh, Communication. Here I describe it though as a memorandum. This was a report made about the terrifying possibility of weapons of mass destruction, that the United States was developing weapons to eventually achieve absolute power over the world. And therefore, the United States must take any steps necessary to subvert and destroy that effort. They needed to rapidly build up political, economic, and military strength to oppose the expansion of communism from the Soviet Union. This became official government policy. This official government policy was seen in the, um, uh, I should say, was a response to the failures of what had happened in Korea. At the end of the Second World War, when the Japanese surrendered to the United States, the Japanese were still in possession of the country of Korea. The United States then moved in to take that country from the Japanese coming in from the South. Meanwhile, the communist Russia, the Soviet Union, moved into Korea from the north. The Soviets and the Americans met in the middle. And the same sort of, un, sort of uncomfortable truce that took place in Europe with it being divided in half also took place in Korea. The Soviet Union established in North Korea the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, while the Republic of Korea was established in the south. Like what happened in Europe, the Soviet established country, despite its claim to being a democratic republic, was actually a communist dictatorship, while South Korea was a capitalist friendly country. By 1950, though, the North Koreans decided to invade South Korea to try to make the entire country a communist country. <clears throat> 
In response to this, the United Nations authorized a military force to go in to protect the South Koreans. This became the Korean War. The leader of that UN authorized force was General Douglas MacArthur, an American, and most of the troops were American. During the war, the United States beat the, the North Koreans back and had almost won the war when China entered the war on behalf of the North Koreans. So the North Koreans then had support both from the Soviet Union, who had originally established them, and their Chinese neighbors who sent over a million Chinese troops in to help them. At that point, the United States began to lose the war. Eventually, the United States was able to fight its way back to a rough division of Korea in the middle, which ended up being where things settled down at the end of the war. But it was the, this back and forth, this aggressive attack by the, the communists which led to that National Security Memorandum on the previous slide, recognizing the inherent expansionist tendency of the, of the communists and their obvious desire to eventually achieve global domination. Well, even as the war got bogged down in Korea, the general over the US forces there, Douglas MacArthur, thought he saw a way to win the war. He suggested in 1951 to President Harry Truman that he be allowed to bomb China with nuclear weapons. This would then cause the Chinese to withdraw their troops from Korea and allow him to win the Korean War. President Harry Truman, who had authorized the dropping of atomic bombs on Japan to end the Second World War, was horrified by the idea of having to drop more nuclear bombs. He felt he had already caused enough death in the world, and he wasn't sure that MacArthur's strategy would even work. So he said no. In response to that, Douglas MacArthur began to publicly criticize the president. The president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. Douglas MacArthur, as a general within the United States military, answers to him. So in response to him criticizing the president's decision, President Harry Truman fired Douglas MacArthur. An interesting effect of this was that shortly after Douglas MacArthur was fired, the general who was aggressive enough to do what it would have taken to win the war, but who was now gone, the Soviet Union then proposed to the United States a ceasefire in Korea. It's interesting that this came only after the man who was willing to do what it took to defeat the communists was no longer in charge. Then the, the communists were willing to stop shooting and settle into the division of Korea that exists to this day. But that a division of Korea did not become official for quite some time. We even had an presidential election in the meantime. In 1952, the Democratic candidate, Adlai Stevenson, was defeated by the Republican candidate, Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was a moderate Republican. In fact, he was so moderate that before the um, parties had settled on their nominees, both the Democrats and the Republicans had courted him to be the nominee of their party. Now why? Dwight Eisenhower was the supreme commander of all the Allied forces in Europe during World War II. He was a war hero, but not just a war hero. He was a man who was accustomed to being in charge of a massively complicated bureaucratic machine, which is the military. So he seemed to have the talent and abilities that would be necessary to be a successful president. But no one was quite sure where his political views were. He had never, in fact, voted in his life before he voted for himself running for president. He had refused to vote because he felt it was his obligation as a man in the military to remain politically neutral. He eventually decided to run as a Republican to stop what he saw as some of the more extreme people in the Republican Party from taking it in a direction he didn't want it to go. He easily won the election against Adlai Stevenson in 1952 and a rematch between the two men in 1956. After Eisenhower had become president, the two sides in the Korean conflict agreed to a more official ceasefire this was the Korean Armistice Agreement. Now notice they had agreed to a ceasefire before and had stopped shooting, but it wasn't until 1953 that it became official. By that time, 
more than one and a half million people had died during the Korean War, including tens of thousands of Americans. The Korean armistice remains in effect to this day. There has been no peace treaty to end the Korean War. Officially, the United Nations forces, primarily the United States, are still at war with North Korea, but there hasn't been any shooting between them in almost 70 years. Well, I should say any significant shooting. There's been a few little shots fired across the border between border guards, but no out, out, um, all out conflict since the Korean armistice was signed. The next thing we need to cover in this chapter is the um, technological side of the Cold War, particularly the buildup in arms, in other words, weapons, and the space race. After the United States successfully tested atomic bombs at the end of World War II and then dropped them on Japan to end the war, the Soviet Union in a fairly short time developed its own atomic bomb and completely surprised the United States when they did so. This was made possible because of a spy, Klaus Fuchs, who worked on the Manhattan Project, the development of the United States atomic bomb. He passed secrets on how to develop the bomb on to the Soviet Union, which allowed them to develop their own bomb much faster than expected. Once the Soviet Union had nuclear bomb technology, this then led to a nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. As each of them tried to develop better and more bombs to use as a threat toward the other. This chart shows how many nuclear bombs each of the, the two um, countries that opposed each other in the Cold War had over time. You can see that the, the Soviet Union ended up eventually with many more bombs than the United States, but then their numbers quickly fall with the end of the Soviet Union, which we will talk about later in this chapter. But this arms race of developing bigger and better and more atomic bombs was a huge financial drain on both countries. And this ends up being part of the cause for the Cold War to eventually end. In 1952, the United States developed a more sophisticated kind of atomic bomb called a thermonuclear weapon, or for short, an H-bomb, the H standing for hydrogen. Where the original atomic bombs that were used at the end of World War II were fission bombs, in other words, they derived their energy from the splitting of atoms, the H-bomb is a fusion bomb, which derives its power from the combining of atoms. It has potential for unlimited explosive power, much more powerful than the first generation of atomic bombs. Well, believe it or not, only one year later, the Soviet Union exploded its own H-bomb. Now, you may be able to believe that today, but it was stunning for people at the time. That the, that the Soviet Union was able to keep up in weapons development with the United States. As the two sides were able to create more powerful bombs and build more and more of them, this then led to an uneasy truce between the two. This is one of the reasons why the Cold War remained cold, because they both had so many weapons of such powerful capacity that if the United States and Soviet Union had ever had a full out war with each other, they could have devastated the entire surface of the globe and, and killed off nearly every human. That sort of incredible destructive power need only remain a threat and it can stop the other side from ever firing the first shot. If what you do is assure the other side that if they ever fire the first shot, you will fire all your missiles and then they'll have to fire all theirs, and both sides will cease to exist in a nuclear firestorm. Because neither side wants that to happen, as long as the threat is credible from each of them, neither will ever fire the first shot. This way of keeping the peace is called mutually assured destruction, or MAD for short. And this is the way that peace was kept throughout the Cold War. This policy of mutually assured destruction was first announced by Dwight Eisenhower in 1953, when after the Soviet Union had detonated its hydrogen bomb, 
Eisenhower said that any firing of a bomb by the Soviet Union toward the United States would result in massive retaliation against the Soviet Union of every bomb that the United States had. This then became the common policy between the two that prevented either from shooting first. But Dwight Eisenhower didn't want atomic power to be seen merely as a force for destruction. So he gave a speech and instituted a policy that became known as Atoms for Peace, where the United States would freely share information with other countries about the development of nuclear power. This was the peaceful side of the atom. It could be used for um, energy production. It could be used for medicine, such as for fighting cancer, things like that. He wanted to share these peaceful uses with the world as a way to generate goodwill with the world in this Cold War as the United States and the Soviet Union competed for the hearts and minds of people in countries around the globe. Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program then led to the establishment of the Auton International Atomic Energy Commission in 1957 to promote peaceful uses of nuclear power, including promoting the building of nuclear power plants around the world to generate energy for people. But they still had to worry about the negative side of nuclear power, its potential threat as a nuclear bomb. So the United States created the Federal Civil Defense Administration in 1950 to help people prepare for the possibility of nuclear war. They published a series of cartoons hosted by a character called Bert the Turtle that taught people in case of a nuclear blast to duck and cover. This meant children hiding under their desks at school. Now, in some ways, this is kind of a silly response. If a nuclear bomb explodes close enough, it doesn't matter if you're hiding under your desk, you'll be vaporized. And even if it isn't close to enough for that, you will likely suffer from severe radiation poisoning, whether you're hiding under a desk or not. So why institute a program like this? Because it was designed to ease the fears of the population. They had to believe that nuclear war was survivable, or they may, might not be able to deal with the stresses of having these two sides constantly having nuclear bombs aimed at each other. In addition to the nuclear arms race, there was also a space race between the two countries to establish themselves as the, the preeminent explorers of outer space. This was done for the propaganda value of trying to prove that their system was better than the others so that they would attract people from other countries to join their side. Both of them based their technological beginnings of the space race on the development of the Nazi superweapon programs. Throughout the Second World War, Adolf Hitler encouraged his scientists to experiment with advanced weapons, believing that technology might be the key to winning the war, even as he became outnumbered by the Allies and their huge armies. One of these programs was the development of rockets that could send bombs from France and have them land in Great Britain without a plane needing to carry them. The most advanced of these models was the V-2 rocket developed in 1944, which rained terror down upon um, cities in England. It was a terror weapon because it flew, it flew faster than the speed of sound. This meant that it would impact before anyone even heard that it was coming and destroy entire buildings or city blocks. Well, after the war was over, there was a race between the United States and the Soviet Union to gather up as many of the materials of the Nazi rocket program as possible to use them to develop their own rocket programs. The United States was more successful in tracking down the, the, the scientists and the materials from these rocket programs, including the head of the Nazi program, a man named Werner von Braun. He was brought to the United States, but not as a prisoner to be punished for developing the V-2 rockets, instead as an honored scientist to help the United States develop better rockets. He actually became the leader of the United States space program. 
Meanwhile, the Soviets, while they didn't capture scientists of the level of Werner von Braun to help with their system, they had their own scientific genius, a man named Sergei Korolev. He supervised their rocket program. They did find entire rockets and factories set up to build them that they captured and hauled back to the Soviet Union so that they could reverse engineer them and still make use of what the Nazis had learned. But rather than having a former Nazi in charge, they had a former political prisoner within the Soviet Union who was put in charge of their rocket program because of his genius. The Soviet Union was able to um, achieved the first true rocket success when they developed in 1957 a functioning intercontinental ballistic missile, otherwise known as an ICBM. An ICBM is capable of, develop, de of delivering a payload, in other words, a nuclear bomb, from one continent to another. It could be launched from the Soviet Union and deliver a bomb to the United States, in other words. The United States had fallen behind already in the space race. Shortly thereafter, one of these ICBMs was used to place a small satellite in orbit called Sputnik 1. This was the first human-made satellite. Now that word satellite just refers to something orbiting something else. So the moon is a satellite of the Earth, but there are other smaller rocks that could be orbiting the Earth too. Sputnik was the first man-made object put up in orbit around the planet. It was just a hollow shell with a radio transmitter inside of it going beep, beep, beep. It really did no scientific work there. But it was a great propaganda achievement as it showed the, that the Soviets were ahead of the United States in their capacity to put things into space. Unfortunately, the United States probably could have put up a satellite earlier one that actually did scientific experiments. But they had delayed it to coincide with a scientific conference. And so the Soviets got theirs up first and got the propaganda victory of doing so. Well, in response to the Soviets' successes in the space race, the United States established the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, commonly known as NASA, to oversee its space program to try to help the, the United States catch up. Eventually, the United States would catch up and exceed the achievements of the Soviet Union, but that was a decade away. The United States at this point was still falling farther behind. In 1959, the, United, the, the Soviet Union used one of its rockets to launch Luna 2, which was essentially a big bullet which impacted with the moon. It was just a crash landing but it was the first human object to reach the moon, another propaganda vi victory for the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union's biggest achievement in space before the United States was the placing of a man in orbit around the Earth. That man was Yuri Gagarin. He was the first man to go into space, and he didn't just go into space, he went all the way around the planet. This was an incredible achievement, that they were able to put a man in space and bring him safely back to the Earth after orbiting it. The United States, a month later, had to get a man in space quick and dirty, just to show that they hadn't fallen so far behind. They did this through what was called Project Mercury, the American Manned Space Program. But their first flight was only able to put astronaut Alan Shepard the first American in space, into a suborbital flight. This means he went up in the air, just high enough to say, woo, I'm in space, and then came back down in the ocean nearby. This is the same sort of flight that billionaires are now taking in modern America on their own private rockets, suborbital flights to just be able to go up and say they are in space and then come back down, not actually orbiting the Earth. That would come later for the United States. At this point, the Soviets were far ahead. To try to catch up, a new research arm of the military was established, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, commonly known as DARPA in 1958. This was a, a program created within the United States military to develop sort of extreme technologies with the resources and secrecy of the United States government behind it. 
at the same time that the United States was losing the space race to the Soviet Union and being um, uh, fought to a draw in the arms race by the Soviet Union, the United States was getting increasingly worried about the influence of communism within our own borders. This led to the Red Scare and something that became known as McCarthyism. President Harry Truman, as the president, was concerned that there might be disloyal people within the government of the United States that supported communism. So in 1947, he issued an executive order, 9835, which required all members of the United States government to go undergo loyalty examination, where they would be interviewed and questioned to see if they truly were loyal to the United States of America or were um, being seduced by um, communism. Harry Truman was an example of the general attitude among Americans about communism in 1947. Even liberals within the American political system touted that they were anti-communist. Nobody wanted communism in America at this time. Now, I point out that even liberals were anti-communists because liberals, in some ways, have some ideological kinship to communism. Liberals tend to believe in big government, doing lots of programs to make um, people's lives more fair. That sounds like the basic idea of communism, too. It's all in how extreme they're willing to go with the authority of government. Are they willing to go all the way to a dictatorship? It's also how extreme they are willing to go in trying to make people equal. Are they willing to take away all private property like communism with and would and distribute to everybody the same things? Liberals of this time period said, no, we are not communists. We don't believe in those sorts of extreme things. In fact, we oppose communists. This led to the establishment of a democratic organization called Americans for Democratic Action which was an explicitly anti-communist organization established by liberals such as, here in the middle of this picture, Eleanor Roosevelt, the surviving wife of the dead Franklin Roosevelt, who had been president of the United States during the Great Depression and the Second World War. The most prominent figure in the anti-communist crusades of this time period was a senator named Joseph McCarthy. Joseph McCarthy became famous when he waved a, a piece of paper during a speech and claimed on that piece of paper he had a list of over 200 communists who were members of the United States government. Now, later on, as he was pushed about who was actually on this list, the numbers changed in various other speeches from 57 to 81 to something else. Turned out he never really had a list of communists, but he was convinced that there were communists in the government. He only ended up ever naming one specific name. But in a sense, it didn't matter. He was expressing a general feel, fear held among the American people. And while his list may have been fake, in some ways it was true. Later on, events would reveal that there definitely were communist infiltrators in the government of the United States. McCarthy wasn't the only person who was seeking out communists. The House of Representatives in 1938, even before the Second World War, established an Un-American Activities Committee, essentially a congressional committee to hunt down communists in the United States. So this was a bipartisan um, fear during this time. Both Democrats and Republicans, senators and members of the House of Representatives, all feared during this period that communism was having a secret influence over the United States and they wanted to keep it out. In 1950, a law was passed, commonly known as the McCarran Act, but more technically known as the Internal Security Act, which required all communist organizations to register with the United States government. Now notice this is not outlying communism in the United States but it's trying to allow the United States government to keep an eye on communists by forcing them to register with the government so that they can be tracked. Now, a law like this would be considered sort of blatantly unconstitutional today. 
people would be considered to have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, to um, meet with whoever they wanted, even fellow communists, without the intimidating force of the United States government trying to force them to register and thereby suppress their expression of their communist points of view. But this wasn't the case at the time in the Cold War. This was considered a reasonable effort to try to prevent the spread of communism in the United States. While McCarthy couldn't name a bunch of communist spies, another communist hunter was more successful. In 1948, a representative in the House of Representatives from California named Richard Nixon publicly accused a government official, Alger Hiss, of being a communist. Alger Hiss was an important figure in American political history. He had been the Secretary General of the first UN Charter Conference in San Francisco. He had been a longtime member of the United States State Department. He was a prominent member of the United States government. And Richard Nixon accused him of being a secret communist trying to subvert the United States. Well, another man, Whitaker Chambers, an author and journalist, came forward and testified before Richard Nixon's committee that he had been part of this secret communist underground, that he was one of the secret communists also, that he was a conspirator to establish communism in the United States, and that Alger Hiss was in fact a member of the same organization. Later on, this would be true, proven to be true, but at the time there wasn't sufficient proof. What happened was Alger Hiss was put on trial um, multiple times for being a secret communist who had betrayed the United States. There was always a hung jury. He was never convicted. We couldn't, they couldn't get a jury to agree on whether he was actually a communist spy or not. But he was eventually sent for prison for lying during his trials, committing the crime of perjury. It wasn't until years later that evidence came out that he was, in fact, a communist. Another couple of communists that were exposed were Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who worked on, the husband, Julius Rosenberg, worked on America's atomic bomb program. He was caught passing secrets to the Soviet Union through the Communist Party. When he was caught, his wife was also arrested as a co-conspirator. They were convicted and eventually executed as communist spies. The um, exposure of Alger Hiss and of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg made clear that communist spies trying to work for the Soviet Union did in fact exist within the United States, even if um, Senator McCarthy couldn't actually name them. But McCarthy's hunt for communists left a bad taste in many people's mouths. They felt that he was going too far, accusing people of being communists who were not. This then led to a conflict within the government and an investigation of him. A committee was organized in the United States Senate led by a Senator Tidings. Senator Tidings was a Democrat from Maryland who thought that McCarthy's const constant hunt for communists was giving people on the left side of the political spectrum a um, bad reputation. He wanted to bring McCarthy down. So they invested McCarthy and they ended up determining that his claims to knowing about communists were a fraud and a hoax. This would eventually lead to McCarthy leaving the United States Senate and finally dying, as I'll discuss in a moment. It wasn't just these Democrats in the United States Senate that were ready to stand up against the Red Scare. It was also artists like Arthur Miller, a playwright. He wrote a play called The Crucible, which on its surface seemed to be about the Salem witch trials, where people were being wrongly accused of being witches, which led to the imprisonment, torture, and death of people. It was a thinly veiled um, criticism of McCarthyism. Essentially, he was saying that a witch trial was going on in America where people were being hunted down and accused of being communists and their wife, lives being destroyed without them actually being communists. Interestingly, evidence suggests that Arthur Miller, who wrote this play, was in fact a communist himself. 
1954, the United States Senate voted to censor Joseph McCarthy because of the fraud he had committed in claiming that he knew people were communists who were not. And this general attitude of making unfounded accusations about communism became known as McCarthyism. It, uh, that term is also used today to describe any sort of frantic witch hunt where you identify somebody that you think is scary in society and start accusing people of being that thing to bring them down. In modern America today, the equivalent might be accusing people of being racists who are not racists as a way to destroy them. Well, after Sen Senator McCarthy was censored for his um, lies about who was a communist, he lost his assignments within the United States Senate on committees, he lost his power within the Senate, he took up drinking heavily, and eventually within a few years he was dead. Now, one of the reasons that McCarthy may have had a hard time tracking down real communists is because communists were going into hiding in the United States. There had long been a communist party in the United States and they held popular conventions and nominated people for public office. But beginning during this time period, as they saw the um, great uh, um, force of common citizens against communism in the United States of America and the uniting of people from both political parties against them, they decided to become less obvious about their communism. They moved away from the Communist Party and other explicitly communist organizations and took on a new strategy. The strategy was known as the Communist Popular Front, and it was to join in with other institutions and influence them to become more communist without having explicitly communist organizations. It was also to try to embed communism in the American story. Here we have a, um, a pamphlet from one of their productions uh, a uh, play called this, uh, excuse me, a musical called This Fourth of July, in which they tried to characterize the founding fathers as essentially advocates for communism. In this way, communists tried to ease into American life and subtly influence people to adopt their values without them acknowledging that they might be explicitly communist values. The place that they most drifted into secretly to influence was the Democratic Party. In 1954, to, ca to combat this growing communist influence that was perceived in the United States, the United States Congress passed the Communist Control Act. The Communist Control Act made it a criminal offense to become a member of the Communist Party. But this had little effect, because as I discussed on the previous slide, communists had already decided that they needed to become more subtle with their influence, not let people know, hey, I'm a communist, hate me. Instead, join in as a Democrat and say, you know what, we need more government control of the means of production. The government continued to actively fight against communism in ways that might seem really surprising today. An example was a series of propaganda films that were produced by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. You don't think the FBI is movie makers, but there was a man in charge of the FBI for several decades named J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover had an iron control over the FBI. Didn't matter what presidents came and went, they left him alone to do what he wanted. It's rumored that the reason for this is because he had dirt on all these presidents. He sent out his agents to investigate anybody that was politically powerful, dig up things that they'd done wrong in their past, and then he threatened them with those things to leave him in control, total control of the FBI and what it did. He used this total control to use the FBI to film a series of anti-communist movies that were actually shown in theaters as political propaganda to get the American people to not embrace communism. This general attitude against communism in the United States and the interviews that were done by McCarthy and the House Un-American Affairs Activities Committee led to the creation of what became known as the Hollywood Blacklist. 
as people in, in um, positions in Hollywood, as screenplay writers or movie directors or movie producers, were accused of being communists, they essentially lost any opportunity to work in Hollywood. Now, there were certainly communists in Hollywood. Many of them didn't make the list. But some people who weren't necessarily communists did make the list. And this went on for over a decade that they were kept out of getting jobs because of their perceived in, um, connection with communism. Another group that became explicitly anti-communist during this time period were Christians in the United States. Now, this might seem unusual if you think about it, because Christians oftentimes believe in working for the poor and the needy. And this is one of the basic appeals of communism is those that are in poverty can be assisted by the government to get out of it. That society can be more made more fair, which might seem to appeal to Christians also. But there's a problem. The kind of communism that had developed in places like China and the Soviet Union was explicitly anti-religious. It was atheistic. If there was going to be any God, it would be the state and the rulers of it, the communist dictatorship which set the rules for every aspect of people's lives. Well, the explicitly anti-religious nature of communism led religious people in the United States of America to become very anti-communist. An example of this is the preacher Billy Graham, an evangelist who would get, get big crowds during the 1950s. He was very explicitly anti-communist in his preaching. This feeling that communism was against religion allowed religious symbols to be an important symbolic part of the fight against communism. In 1956, the national motto was established as In God We Trust. That thing that you see on coins didn't exist before then. And the Pledge of Allegiance was altered in 1954 to then include the words One Nation Under God, which had not been in the Pledge of Allegiance previously. So these explicitly religious no, um, uh, symbols in the governance of the United States are actually a fairly recent development in United States history. And it was done as a backlash against communism. Another thing that was done during this time of the Red Scare was a practice called red baiting. This is when some group would um, connect somebody with communism um, and thereby try to destroy their credibility. An example here is seen in the John Birch Society, a society that was created specifically to fight communism within the United States. They produced a series of billboards that they put up, which showed Dr. Martin Luther King, the hero of the civil rights movement, in a class learning about communism. They tried to discredit him as a leader by connecting him to this practice that most people disavowed, communism. Now, there is some evidence that Martin Luther King actually did have some sympathies toward communism. But labeling him as a communist was probably a step too far. But this is the kind of thing that was done. Again, we can see the same sort of thing being done in America today. The same sort of tactic, just not about communism. In America today, what you do is you label somebody a white supremacist as a way to destroy their credibility, whether it is true or not. The next topic in this chapter is the decolonization of, uh, of the world and the American century. And these are two ideas that go together. The American century is a term which was first coined by an author, Henry Luce, in um, a magazine in 1941. The magazine's called Life Magazine, doesn't exist anymore. What he first saw early in the, in the Second World War was that after the conclusion of the, of the World War, the United States would be left as a sole superpower in the world that would have extreme influence over the international system. This ended up being true as the United Nations was established and these various other international treaties and monetary systems and things like that that tried to mirror the influence of the United States. 
He believed that this would lead to a century in which the United States would be the preeminent influence over other people in the world. We have probably seen this in fact come true. But he also characterized the United States as a reluctant superpower. That we, unlike previous um, empire builders in times past, would not use our great advantage of technology and of political system to try to dominate the world for our own enrichment, but instead we would do it to try to benefit others. We would not take over other countries and absorb them into our empire. Instead, we would free them to make their own decisions about what kind of government they might have. He saw this, therefore, as a benevolent superpower and the American century as a positive for the world. Well, whether or not the world would have an American century was an important question as European powers decolonized after World War II. Now, please remember previously in US history, we've discussed how the major powers of Europe created colonies all over the world. Well, by the end of the World War II, few of them were left, mostly concentrated in Africa and some places in Asia. But even places like Greenland was a colony of Denmark and Alaska was a colony of the United States. They are colored in red on this map, things that were explicitly still colonies. But what is going to happen is the, the European powers are going to give up these colonies in the years to come after World War II. They're going to allow these countries to become independent nations. But then a question would have to be answered. In the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, whose side would these colonies take as they became independent countries? This idea, this thought of who these newly independent countries and who some of the smaller countries around the world who had not been independent for very long, whose side they would take, led to the division of the world into three spheres when this up question was talked about. The United States and its allied Western sort of um, capitalist democracies became known as the first world. The Soviet Union and its um, satellite countries and China became known as the second world, the communist dominated part of the world. And then the unaffiliated countries, mostly in Africa and South America and the Middle East, became known as the third world. These were oftentimes um, countries that were backwards technologically and financially that they had a lower standard of living than countries certainly of the first world and even possibly of the second world. But they were unaffiliated. They were the ones that the United States and the Soviet Union were trying to influence to take their side in the Cold War. And the United States was concerned about who would fill this power vacuum in those newly independent countries. The United States was afraid that if the Soviet Union got influence in some of these countries, it would lead to what was called the domino theory, where the Soviet Union might influence one country to become communist, and then it would influence neighbor, its neighbor to become communist, which would influence its neighbor to become communist, etc., etc., across the world, until eventually, perhaps the United States would be left as the only non-communist country. This led to the United States wanting to stop the spread of communism even a little bit around the world, to stop these dominoes from falling. This is why this, the Cuban Revolution, which led to the establishment of a communist country in Cuba, was seen as such a threat to the United States. Fidel Castro was the leader of this revolution. And when he set up Cuba as a communist country allied with the Soviet Union, with it only 90 miles off of the coast of Florida, this caused great fear in the United States that communism was spreading to the Western Hemisphere to neighbors of the United States. Even as the United States was worried about communism spreading to its doorstep in, the, uh, in Cuba, the United States was gearing up for a protracted conflict with the Soviet Union. Unlike previous wars where um, after the war was over, a country might demobilize its military and go back to a, a setting of peace where you don't have a big army around. The United States, because of the whole Cold War, 
felt like we had to have a permanent military structure in place to defend against the threat of the Soviet Union. Well, Dwight Eisenhower, when he left office at the end of his presidency, um, sound a, an alarm against this permanent war economy that was being set up and particularly warned the country about what he called the military industrial complex. What he warned against was that there was an incentive, an incentive for the Defense Department to keep us feeling in fear of war so that they'd remain powerful. There was an incentive for the fact for the companies that manufactured weapons to keep us in continual feel of fear, fear of war, so we would buy their um, their products, and an incentive for members of the United States government who worked with the military and these defense contractors to keep us feeling in a permanent fear of war, so that they would continue to remain, remain powerful in Congress. So essentially you have a triangle of groups here all working together who are determined to keep us believing that war is always around the corner so they can remain powerful. And Eisenhower feared that they might eventually become so powerful and so determined to maintain their power that they might infringe upon the freedoms and peace of Americans. He worried that it could eventually degenerate even to into a military an economic dictatorship of sorts. Well, that warning continues to be with us today. We continue to worry about the, the power of the defense industry and its allies in government and in the military. But despite those fears, the United States had to keep a powerful military during the Cold War because of the threat of the Soviet Union. And while they did not directly go into war with each other, they did engage in what a series of what are called proxy wars. This is where conflicts it broke out in places like Korea and Vietnam, which were disputes over whether or not a country would become communist or not, with one side being supported by the United States and the other side being supported by the communist countries of the Soviet Union and China. These were essentially ways for the superpowers, the capitalist um, uh, de democratic United States and the authoritarian communist Soviet Union to go to war with each other without actually going to war with each other. They were still fighting over whether Vietnam, for example, would become uh, communist without them actually shooting at each other. During the period of detente during the um, uh, Cold War, the United States decided that a way to maybe influence peoples of the world, including peoples of the Soviet Union, to better value the American system was through a series of cultural exchanges. These were authorized and funded through something called the Smith-Munt Act, where the United States sent people and um, uh, displays around the world to try to influence people um, in other countries to believe in the values of the American system instead of the Soviet communist one. They even sent these presentations to the Soviet Union them, itself. In this photo, we see a setup of a typical American home that people in the Soviet Union could tour through. And leading the tour on this day is Richard Nixon, the Vice President of the United States. And taking the tour is Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Famously, when they reached the kitchen in this display home, they ended up in an argument. It became known as the kitchen debate, in which Richard Nixon advocated for the great benefits of a capitalist system, which brings the modern conveniences of life to the average American citizen, from refrigerators to dishwashers. While Nikita Khrushchev argued that this, these sorts of conveniences made the American people soft, and it wasted resources on people who already had enough, while other people lived in the America in poverty. This was a famous debate that went on for days between the two as they moved on to other things during the trip, and it shows the essential conflict between the two sides. Well, that period of detente, as I talked about at the beginning of this uh, chapter, eventually gave way to the presidency of Ronald Reagan.
where Ronald Reagan decided to increase the tension, increase the aggression between the two countries, because he believed that the Soviet Union couldn't keep up. He applied constant pressure to the Soviet Union, such as when he stood before the Berlin Wall and called on the Soviet Union to tear it down, to free the people of East, of, of East Berlin, to interact with those in West Berlin. Eventually, that would actually happen in 1989, when the Soviet Union could no longer financially support the communist regimes in its satellite countries. Those regimes began to fall apart and the people rose up against them. In Berlin, this led the people to go out and physically tear down the wall that had cut off the two parts of the city from each other. This then led a couple of years later to the actual fall of the Soviet Union as its own satellite countries broke away from it, and then rebellion broke out within it. Eventually, the military itself shifted over, and the Soviet Union fell and was replaced by the country of Russia once again. Here you can see a member of the Soviet military on top of a tank in 1991, waving the traditional Russian flag, even as the red flag of the Soviet Union was torn down. The Soviet Union completely collapsed in 1991 under economic and military pressure from the United States without a shot being directly fired between the two. Part of what made it possible was Mikhail Gorbachev had become the leader of the Soviet Union. And as he saw the Soviet Union's inability to keep up with the pressure of the United States and the, their potential clamoring for the advances that they saw in the capitalist West, he decided that a way to put off the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union was to make it more open to Western things. He thought that a middle ground could be achieved, where the Soviet Union would embrace some things from the West while remaining communist. It was a failure. As the people became more exposed to Western things, they became more hungry for the end of communism, which led to its total collapse in the Soviet Union in 1991, and the United States had won the Cold War. And that ends this lecture for Chapter 25, The Cold War in the American Yop.